Blair of the Mounties, the story of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. We present the 13th episode in the dramatic series Blair of the Mounties. 1915. The Dominion of Canada at war since our last episode. Three more Canadian divisions have left Canada for the battlefront. After the Battle of the Marne and the drive for the Channel ports, the great armies have settled down to the long war of attrition. The grim lines of trenches stretch from the English Channel to Switzerland. Inspector Blair and his assistant, Sergeant Marshall, are now on special service in France. Where are you, Marshal? Right here, Inspector. It's pretty dark. Yes. Where's that guide? Here I am, sir. Right ahead of you. Take care now and keep on the duck boards. They're much pretty deep here. How far is it to this 90th Battalion headquarters? Just a little piece now, sir. We're getting close to the line. There's the old ridge ahead of you where you see them flags going up. Fine. Go ahead. Queer kind of war, Inspector. Look at all those fireworks. Now, them's uh, the German trenches. They use a uh, awful lot of flares. Help! Help! Wait for the love of McGinty. And it's my old friend Spike, so it is. Ah, it's you, is it? What do you want? Well, I'll have a couple of gentlemen here to see the commanding officer. All right, Ronnie. Better wait here. You too, Marshal. I'll go down and talk to Colonel Smith. Now, what's your head says going down them stairs? Hello, down there. I'm looking for Colonel Smith. Here you are. I'm Colonel Smith. Oh, excuse me, sir. Good evening, sir. My name's Blair. Oh, yes, Blair. I've heard about you from the general. Sit down. Mind that gas curtain. Thanks. Uh, here's the general's letter, sir. No, never mind that. I know the contents. This is a bad business, Blair. If you'd just give me an outline of the things, uh, perhaps I can help you. Well, I hope so. But I don't see how. We've had lots of spy, spy scares, but this is the real thing. Any proof that there's a spy working? Proof? No. Plenty of indications, though. The enemy's onto everything we do. Our reliefs get shot up, and our raiding parties are simply getting massacred. Any suspicions? Not a trace. What about your officers? Blair, I'd stake my life on every one of them. I see. I sent for Ralston. He's our scout officer. Knows more about this than I do. He'll work with you. Now, who have you got with you? Just uh, Sergeant Marshall. And then the uh, general lent me his own runner. He's all right, I suppose. Who? Mickey Flanagan? Yeah. <laughs> I should say so. Knows every foot of those trenches. And he's the most expert r- ration thief in the Canadian Army. <laughs> Seems rather versatile, chap. <laughs> yes. Mickey's traveled a lot. No education, but talks several languages. You should hear him talk to our German prisoners. You mean he speaks German? Just like a native. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, oh, come in, Ralston. Blair, this is Lieutenant Ralston. Uh, how are you, Ralston? How are you, sir? Ralston, this is the special service officer on that spy job. Give him all the assistance he wants. Very well, sir. All right, Blair, that's all now. Let me know if you need anything. See you in the morning. Thanks. Good night, sir. Good night. Well, what's the program, Russell? Well, I thought we'd uh, talk things over first, sir. Then we can uh, look around the front line. It's bright moonlight, and uh, we can see pretty well. Right, that suits me. Now, here's a map of our t- trench positions in the German lines opposite. Mm-hmm. You see, we're on the slope of a ridge here, and the Germans are on the other slope. The top of the ridge is no man's land. What are these circular things along the front line? Well, those are the big mine craters. There's one of them inside our lines, eh? Yes, it's uh, funny you should mention that. What do you mean? Well, the... You see, it's the only point from which we can see into the German lines. The only thing we have got on the theory that the spy came in that somebody had been signaling to the enemy from that crater. What do you think of the idea yourself? Oh, I think it's a very likely story. All right, we might as well start somewhere. Suppose we take shifts tonight, you and Marshal and I. We'll watch that crater through the hours of darkness, to our ships, eh? Oh, well, nothing like starting in at once, I suppose. Exactly. Never mind that trip around the trenches. We'll start in right away. Marshal, you take first shift. I'll take second... Ralston the third, understand? Right on, Inspector. Fine. I'm going to turn in for a couple of hours. See you later. Breakfast ready, sir. Oh, hello, Mickey. What time is it? 6.30, sir, in a fine morning. Hey, wake up, Marshal. Breakfast. Uh, 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 oh, oh, good morning, sir. Better turn out and get something to eat, Marshal. Ralston will be around pretty soon. Did you pick up anything last night, sir? No, I didn't expect to. What? Oh, then you don't think much of this crater idea. I thought it was pretty foolish myself. On the contrary, I believe it's going to work out all right. You do? Why, well, it doesn't look reasonable to me. Shh, there's somebody coming in. 
Below there. Oh, hello, Ralston. Come in. Thanks. I have some news for you. That's so? Oh, come on down. Uh, did you uh, spot anything last night when you were on duty? I certainly did. What was it? Well, between 3.15 and 3.30, there was a signal light working from Winnipeg Credit toward the German line. But listen, Ralston. Surely a man couldn't use a light right out in the open with hundreds of men around. He'd be spotted in no time. Well, uh, I'll explain. You see, nobody ever thinks of looking back from the front line. And another thing, there's only one point in our trenches from which you can see that crater. That's where we were watching last night. I see. Yes, that's reasonable. It's a clever stunt. Any other details, Austin? Yes, just about 3.15, there was a blue flare from the German lines, just behind Spanbrook Redoubt. I believe it was a signal. Any of our men in that crater? Mm, they weren't supposed to be. You think this fellow will try it on again tonight? Well, uh, I don't know. Well, we'll be on hand again tonight, anyway. Well, then I'll see you tonight, sir. Yes. Goodbye, Austin. Goodbye, sir. Just a little further, Inspector. Look out, mind that hole. <sighs> a man needs eyes like a cat in this darkness. Well, it'll lighten up soon. Well, here's our spot, sir. This is where I stood when I saw that light working. Yes, and now what? Uh, do you see the crater? Yes, I can just make it out. Well, if that fellow starts signaling again, Marsh will be within a few feet of him. We ought to get him. Yeah, I hope so. Do you have any ideas of your own on this case, Inspector? Oh, just one or two. But we'll see how this works out. What time is it? It's past 3.15. Look, Inspector, behind you. What is it? Over that high point in the German lines. A flare. Don't you see it? I see. A bluish sort of light. Eh? Yes, that's it. Just like last night. Now, watch the crater. There he goes. I don't see a thing. Oh, yes. Up near the top of the crater. Yes, he's sending Morse letters. That's it. But surely they can't see that from the enemy lines. It's, it's just a tiny light. Oh, yes, they will, with high-powered glasses. That's quite a message he's sending. Cold of some sort. Sure you've got that crater surrounded? Absolutely. Come on. Let's pick him up. All right. Look here, Inspector. I can't understand this. Aren't you going to question that man we got in the crater last night before you talk to the Colonel Smith? Well, no, not just now, Marshal. What's his name, by the way? Hansen. He says he's a Swede. More likely a German. I see. Seems to me that this fellow Ralston is stealing the show. Does it? Just hang on for a little while. You'll see some fun. We've got to meet Ralston and Colonel Smith in a few minutes. So the mystery is all cleared up. Yes, apparently, sir. I want to congratulate Ralston here. It is a neat piece of work. That's very decent, Blair. Of course, the credit for the man's capture really belongs to Ralston. As I told the general, it takes a man with frontline experience. Oh, probably so. I've no wish to rob Ralston of anything that's coming to him. No, no, of course not. Well, Blair, there won't be any need for you to stay now that it's all cleared up. No, sir. But there is a small matter that I have to attend to. Ralston, put your hands up. Don't move. All right, Marshal, take him. Keep still, Ralston. No use. What in thunder does this mean? Blair, leave that off the Just a moment, sir. You've seen my credentials. I have authority to arrest any person of any rank in this battalion. I'm arresting this man who passes... Under the name of William Ralston. What on earth are you talking about? I mean that this man is a German subject, born in Nuremberg, educated in Canada. He joined the officers' training corps in Montreal in 1914. Let me introduce you to Erich von Sturm, officer in the Imperial German Army. Preposterous! I'll have you court martialed for exceeding your authority. German officer, my eye. Before you do anything foolish, Colonel Smith, you better hear the rest of this story. And I'd advise you to turn this man Hansen loose. He's innocent. Innocent? Didn't we catch him sending signals? Where's the evidence that he did that signaling? Well, for that matter, where's your evidence against Ralston? Uh, Marshal. Yes, sir. Take this officer's belt and tunic off. I suppose the next thing you'll tell me that Ralston was sending those signals himself. Just what he was doing. What? And he was standing with you all the time, 50 feet away from the crater. Excuse me a moment. Find anything, Marshal? Yes, sir. Got a lot of fine rubber cord round his waist. And there's a little electric lamp at the end of it. Good, that's what I want. Well, bless. My soul. Colonel Smith, that's my reason for arresting this officer. He's your spy. He was working that signal himself with the wire marshal found. He was always 50 or 60 feet away when he sent those messages. It was pretty dark, but I happened to spot the trick. Good Lord. I, I, Rothen, or, or whatever your name is, this is monstrous. You masquerade in the uniform of my battalion. You do this after all I've done for you. Why, it's the most damnable Colonel, thing. Colonel that... Smith, this gentleman's my prisoner. 
I must ask you not to make uh, accusations. Barbara! Abominable! Herr Lieutenant, I'm going to send you back to Corps headquarters under close arrest. You'll get a fair trial. That's all I can promise you. That's all I can ask, sir. May I offer my congratulations? <laughs> Sorry about all this, von Sturm. Well, don't apologize. We both serve our countries. I was afraid you weren't as foolish as you pretended to be. All right, Marshal. Take him away. Ah. Oh. Hello, Inspector. Is... Is it all over? Yes, it's over. For heaven's sake, get me a drink. Sure. Sure. What about that execution? Did they... Yes. They shot him at 4.30 this morning. I never felt so utterly sick of my job as I do at this moment. Did he stand up to it? Did he? God, he was wonderful. If you'd seen the way that kid faced the firing party, they read out the sentence and asked him if he had anything to say. And did he? Oh, he just smiled and said, Dutch and liberalis. Then they shot him. Oh, for heaven's sake, give me that drink. Here you are. Thanks. And so the boy could take it. Of course. Ever see a German officer that couldn't? God, I'll never forget the nerve of that youngster. Say what you like about Germany, but there must be something fine about a nation that turns out men like that. You have heard the 13th episode in Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the next episode in this series entitled The Naked Truth. <laughs> Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. We present the 14th episode in the dramatic serial Blair of the Mounties. On Inspector Blair's return from service in France, he finds himself an officer in the newly organized force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The old name has passed with the closing of the war, but it leaves behind it an imperishable tradition of service. Our old friend Sergeant Marshall is stationed at Renfield in northern Saskatchewan. Inspector Blair has run up to Renfield for a few days shooting. Our story opens on the Canadian National Train approaching Renfield. Gee, I'll be glad to get off this joy quarter train. Gosh, what a country. Don't if I know why we ever came up here. Hey, lay off that stuff, Pete. We had to blow somewhere after that Detroit job. But gosh, Tony, it's kind of different up here in Canada. And this idea of pulling a job up here don't sound so good to me. They got them mounted cops up here. Mounted cops, huh? Huh. You've been seeing too many movies. Them birds ain't used to professional guys like you and me. Why, they don't even carry a rod most of the time. So don't get to worrying about them none. Not while we got this here typewriter along. Well, maybe, Tony. Knocking off this here back might be easy enough. But it's the getaway I'm leery about. Say, ain't I put in a month getting onto this location where this here bank's a pushover? And as far as the getaway is concerned, well, we don't need none. What? Don't need no getaway? You ain't gone nuts, have you, Tony? Seems to me all you've been a-doing is talking rusky to them duca bores. Ain't gone religious on me, have you? <laughs> Shucks, Pete. That's part of the setup for this job. What? Say, them dukes ain't gonna help us none. Them boys don't stand for no rough stuff. Oh, listen, I was raised in a Russian settlement, see? I know this took up our racket. Them guys is pacifists, see? I got next to the old guy that runs the Duke colony. Ivan, uh, Ivan is his name. Kidded him, he, he was strong for his religion. Ah, we got a home there as long as we want. You mean that's the getaway? 
Sure, the cops will never look for us there. It's a cinch. And them dukes will never give us away. But if they get wise to our racket, we'll be in Dutch, won't we? Say, who's going to tell them? I got everything fixed, I tell you. We pulled this job. Pinch a car and head south. Then we leave the car and hide out in the bush till dark. After that, we cut cross country to the Tukapor village. Then we're okay, see? Gee, it don't look so rotten at that, Tony. Maybe it might work. Cross it'll work. Leave it to me. I got it all doped out. Well, I hope you're right. You know me, Pete. I never miss. Renfield, next station, Renfield. Ah, Renfield, that's the bird, that's the bird. Now, listen, just keep close to me and have that tummy gun handy, see? Come on, Pete, and make it snappy. There's the joint across the street. It's pretty near closing time. Gee, what a sleepy boy. There ain't nobody in sight. Didn't I tell you? It's a pushover. You sure there's just two guys in this here bank? Sure, that's all. The teller and the manager. You got that typewriter handy? Uh, sure, what do you think? Okay, then. Step on it. Come on. Get near closing time. Come on. Well, looks like I'm just in time. You're closing up? Well, yes, sir. Uh, just uh, three o'clock. Uh, something you want? Yeah, I'd uh, like to cash a check. Uh, let's see. Uh, $250. Peckers Bank in Chicago. Hmm. Have you any one in town here to identify you? Sure, your manager knows me. He's a friend of mine. Oh, excuse me. Uh, come in, I'll get Mr. Bartlett. Yeah, fine. You stay by the door, Pete. Oh, Mr. Bartlett, will you identify this gentleman? He's a friend of yours. Wants to cash a check. Eh? Oh, that? Hmm. Sorry, sir. Don't seem to place you. No? Well, that's too bad. Eh, uh, stick him out. Both of you guys, come on now, stick him up. Okay, Pete, keep that door covered. All clear outside? Sure, nobody in sight. Listen, you can't do this. You'll never get away with it. Ah, uh, shut up. Oh, we'll play a piece on this typewriter. Keep that gun on him, Pete. Ah, oh, this is fine. Vault open and everything. Ah, oh, here's the dough. Well, well, this is a soft touch. Now I gets me a nice little canvas sack, and here we go. You cheap four flusher, you'll get a life sentence for this. Oh, yeah? Then I tell you to keep your trap shut. You ain't getting tired of life, are you? Hey, come on, Tommy. We gotta blow. All right. Say, listen, you two guys get in that vault. Well, listen, you can't. Ah, get in there. For God's sake, don't lock us in there, man. We'll suffocate. Get in there, I tell you. Hello, Inspector. You got back early. Any sport? Oh, not much. Got a couple of prairie chicken and a mallard. Anything doing? What, in Renfield? <laughs> uh, nothing ever happens here, sir. <laughs> Hello, police office. Who? Oh, yes, Mr. Bartley. What? What's that? Stuck up your bag and locked you in the vault? What? The submachine gun? All right. Be right down. Right away. Don't worry. We'll get them. Yes, all right. Goodbye. What is it, Marshal? Renfield Bank, sir. Held up by two men. Carried the submachine gun. Lucky you were here today. Oh, yes. Any other details? No, they locked the manager and his teller in the vault. Good Lord, how'd they get out? Bartlett managed to move the time lock setting up to four o'clock on his way into the vault. Then there's a safety release inside for just such an emergency. Mm. Well, get on to it, Marshal. Chase over the bank. Get the full story and descriptions of the men. Fingerprints, if you can. I'll get on the telephone and put out a general warning. Well, Pete, there's three days gone and nobody got on to us. Well, looks like the waste is over, eh? And the heat ought to be dying down some. Well, was I right or not? Well, you was right about a safe hideout, I'll admit that. But I ain't so strong for this duke boss stuff. Nothing but mush and vegetables. Don't they ever have any meat, for God's sakes? Well, no, you see, they're all vegetarians. Don't believe in taking life. Well, they're awful strict against killing. And these here prayer meetings every night, and me singing hymns. Can you picture it? Say, boy, if it gets any worse, I'm for making a break. Cops or no cops? Ah, take it easy, Pete. They got the big celebration today. Kind of a parade. Hey, you ain't going to no parade, are you? Easy now, easy. We gotta kid them along. You see, I had to tell this old Ivan guy that we was interested in their religion. They got some funny stunts. Why, they might want to put us through some sort of a ceremony today. What? I tell you, I ain't gonna stand for hey, it. Hey, pipe down, pipe down. You gotta go through with it. Why, it ain't gonna hurt us none. Well, all right. Say, what time is it? Uh, pretty near daybreak, I reckon. They'll be starting the doings in a little while. Hey, Tony. Hey, look here. Why, what's wrong? Well, I, gosh, where's them clothes of mine? I left them on that chair. What's the friend, cats? Mine's gone too. Hold on. Wait a minute. Hey, you lousy double crossing rat. Hey! What's eating you? Why, that dough. It was under the mattress. Come on now, where is it? Where is it? Why, how do I know? Say, look at here. Uh, where's that, that gun of mine's gone too? Huh? 
I know what it is. It's them crazy dukes. They got it in the night. Hmm, wise guy, ain't you? Now they got the whole watch, clothes and all. Hold on, hold on, and let me figure this out now. Oh, I got it. You see, these birds are celebrating their anniversary today. It's okay. They always pull them stunts. Everybody goes on a naked procession. It's just a stunt, Pete. You mean they don't wear no clothes at all? That's right. The whole outfit goes naked till sunset. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Pete, but it's only a stunt. Only a stunt? But listen here. How about that gun and all that dough? Fifty thousand bucks. For gosh sakes. Well, I don't know about the dough. Oh, I guess they're just uh, sort of taking care of it for us. Oh, it'll be okay, Pete. And hey, look out. Here's somebody coming. Look out. Oh, my friend. The day is come. Oh, yeah? Say... Oh, for God's sakes, this guy ain't got no clothes on. Sure, uh, good morning, uh, Ivan. Uh, say, uh, you took them clothes. We ain't got nothing to wear. Ah, uh, yes. Today, we put off all earthly clothing. It is the law. Well, yes, but say, uh, there was some money we had here. Do you know anything about that? Money, yes. If you take the Duke of Orphate, all money is common property. Uh? We have it safe. From the weapon of violence you have is not allowed. We destroy it. Oh, suffering cats! See here, Marshal, those fellows couldn't have disappeared like that. It's impossible. I don't know whether it's impossible or not, sir, but there isn't a trace of them. We have accurate descriptions out everywhere. A few false alarms have been checked, but actually they seem to have just disappeared. That's funny. Looks bad, too. I got a wire from the commissioner. He's all hot about it. Hmm. Uh, Bank authorities are raising cane. The most baffling thing I ever saw. Better forget it for a while, Inspector. Something's sure to turn up. Anyhow, I've got another job today. What's that? Duke of Ors. Duke of Ors? What's wrong with them? Today is the 23rd. They have a big powwow out at the Duke of Ors village. It's one of their big days. I had the tip from Cameron a while ago, and they're putting on one of those naked processions again. Really? Funny people, those Duke of Ors. Fancy pulling into that sort of thing nowadays. It seems to be their way of celebrating. What are you going to do? Oh, I was going to get Cameron and a couple of deputies and take a run out there. There isn't much we can do except head them off so that they don't cause a scandal in town. One thing, they never get violent. No, that's funny. They're all big husky men. If they ever did start anything rough, it'd be awkward. Yes. Like to ride out there with me? Ah, yes. I suppose I might as well. All right. Let's be going. Uh. There they come, Inspector. By Jove, yes. And they're heading for the main road to town. All right, it's your show. Better get after that hit man. Hey there. Bottled in? Oh. Policeman, what do you seek? Where are you heading? We go to the town. Nothing doing, Ivan. You know, there'll only be trouble. You'll get fined again if you go there. No, we have now plenty of money. Good fortune has come to us. We care not for fines. See, Inspector, I don't get this. Old Ivan got some bee in his bonnet. Says he has plenty of money. Well, we've got to stop them somehow. Well, we can't do that unless we can prove a criminal action by any of them. And they never commit crimes. Hold on. Hold on. Look, Marshal. By what's wrong? See those two men? Remember that description? Gad, yes. It's those two crooks who robbed the bank. Jumping Moses. <laughs> Tony Bogowski. <laughs> There's your chance. Pick them up quick, Marshal. <laughs> well, of all the ridiculous things. Hey there. <laughs> you two, stand still. <laughs> no, I... I... What? No. no. Hey, cut that out, Tony. We checked your fingerprints yesterday. Come on, talk English. Hey, you guys is making a mistake, I tell you. <laughs> now you've done it. Dukes, parades, applesauce. <laughs> come on, come on, give me a hand, Inspector. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have that pair of handcuffs, Marshal, before I die of laughing. <laughs> Help me, Jimmy. What a headline for the Chicago papers. Tony Bugowski. Leeds Duke of Ore Parade. <laughs> you have heard episode 14 in Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the next chapter in this serial entitled The Clover Creek Mystery.
Blair of the Mounties, the story of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. We present the 15th episode in the dramatic series Blair of the Mounties, entitled The Clover Creek Mystery. In the course of a long and successful career as a detective, Inspector Blair has always held to the belief that human nature and human motives are more important than circumstantial evidence. The story we now submit to you is an example of the truth of this belief. Our scene opens at Renfield, Saskatchewan. Blair, on one of his periodical tours of inspection, is staying a few days with his old friend, Sergeant Marshall. Hello, Inspector. Oh. Come in. I'll be through in a minute. Right. Hello? What's this, a case report? Yes, it's that drowning case out at Clover Creek. Hmm. Didn't you hear about it? Well, no, there's a lot of talk around the hotel... But nobody ever tells the policeman anything unless he insists, you know. Marshal, what is this case? A man named Sutton, out fishing in the big pool just below Clover Creek Ranch. Boat upset. Nobody around to help him. Got the body this morning. Ah, accident, eh? Looks like it. Who was this fellow? Do you know him? Yes, knew him slightly. Pete Sutton, a bachelor. Pretty well fixed. Made a lot of money up in the Yukon. Lives with his brother, Fred Sutton, who owns Clover Creek Ranch. I see. Well, better check up carefully. Make sure it's an accident. Not much doubt of that, Inspector. No marks of violence on the body. Doctor certifies it normal case of death by drowning. Poor chap. Rather tough to die like that with nobody near to help him. Hello. Here's our friend Clayton, in a deuce of a hurry. Yes, I was expecting him. He's Sutton's lawyer. Probably wants to know about the inquest. Come in. Oh, good morning, uh, Marshal. Good morning, Inspector. Morning. Glad to find you here. I came about that Sutton business. Yes, Mr. Clayton. We've set the inquest for two o'clock this afternoon out at the Clover Creek. It's uh, not that I came about. In fact, I think you'd uh, better postpone that inquest. Eh? What for? Well, it's a difficult matter for me to deal with. You know I was legal advisor to Pete Sutton. Yes. Sergeant, I have reason to suspect that my friend Sutton was murdered. What? What do you mean, Clayton? You have any evidence to support such a statement? Why, naturally. You don't suppose I'd go that far without uh, some definite ground. Of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Clayton. Go ahead. I don't want you fellows to think I'm interfering in your business. This is a very unpleasant matter, and I only want to be sure that the facts are thoroughly investigated. What is this evidence you refer to, Mr. Clayton? Well, in the first place, and speaking in confidence, my client, Pete Sutton, the deceased man, willed his money to his brother, Fred Sutton. Yes, I know. But that's no cause for suspicion. Not that alone. But there's a good deal more. Recently, the two brothers had a serious quarrel. Did you know that? No, I can't say I did. You sure of this? Uh, quite sure. Uh, as a result of the quarrel, I was instructed to draw up a new will. You mean old Pete decided to cut his brother out entirely? Practically, yes. All but a small mortgage on the Clover Creek Ranch was to be left to other parties. How much roughly was old Pete worth? Well, leaving out one or two doubtful investments there would be in good real estate and bonds... Ooh, around $80,000. Hmm, that's a nice little fortune. Was the new will signed? No, uh, that's the point of the whole affair. I have it ready in my office. It was to have been signed this morning. Then the drowning of Pete Sutton last night made a difference of $80,000 to his brother Fred. Exactly. Hey, Gad, what do you think of that, Inspector? I think Mr. Clayton had full justification for bringing this up before the inquest. Uh, thanks, Inspector. I uh, hate to be a busybody, but after all, I'm Sutton's representative. Sure, that's all right. But let me get this straight, Mr. Clayton. You suspect Fred Sutton had something to do with his brother's death. Oh, hold on, Sergeant. Uh, that's a police matter. Well, I'm asking you. But don't you see, as a lawyer, I wouldn't want to take a definite attitude without a fuller study of the facts. All right, I'll put it in another way. Fred Sutton has a clear alibi. He and his wife were away to dinner at the McDonald place. Didn't get home till midnight. I wouldn't be too certain of that alibi if I were you. Why not? Well, I really shouldn't give you this, but, well, it's bound to come out. Fred Sutton left the McDonald Ranch about nine o'clock. Said he had a message or something. Got back there about ten. I see. Thanks for the tip. But uh, who did you get that from? Well, it came up from Mrs. Sutton and I when we were talking this morning. Of course, it may be easily explained. 
Well, I've got to get back to the office, unless there's anything else you can think of. No. Thanks, Mr. Clayton. See you later. Yes, I'd like to know if uh, you find out anything. Uh, goodbye. 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 So, that changes the picture a bit, Marshal. Yes. What do you think of it, Inspector? Oh, either a strange coincidence, or else this Fred Sutton had a hand in his brother's death. Better dive into it, Marshal, see if you can find anything out at Clover Creek. Yes, I get out there right away. Coming, Inspector? No, I'll leave you to it. It's your case, Marshal. Anyhow, I'm not going out to Clover Creek at present. I'd like to hang around town today and do a little gossiping. I may run out there later on. Uh, there's only one thing I want to say about this case. What's that, Inspector? Don't arrest anybody till we talk it over. Why, uh, well, of course not. It's hardly likely I'll get evidence enough for that. I don't know. Somehow I think you will. Well, anyway, I'll see you at dinner time. Right on, Inspector. Hello there, Inspector. <laughs> I thought you'd be showing up sooner or later. Yes, yeah, pretty hard to leave a tempting case like this, Marshal. How are you getting on? Find anything? Did I? I should say I did. Clayton had the right idea, Inspector. Old Pete was murdered. You sure of that, Marsh? No doubt of it, Inspector. This Fred Sutton did a good job, but he left plenty of evidence. Ah, well, let's have the story. Is this the boat? Yes, that's it. They found it floating bottom up in the pool, just as it had, as though it had been overturned. Well, what's wrong with that idea? Why, in the first place, that boat wouldn't turn over, just through a man falling out of it. You see, it's quite a big boat. One of those homemade flat bottom things. Yes, it seems a bit impossible. Who found it? Oh, Fred Sutton found it, of course. At least he claims it was floating bottom-up when he came home last night. What's your theory? It's a lot more than a theory, Inspector. Just let's turn this boat upside down. I'll show you. All right. You there see? you are. Huh? There you are. Now, now look here. This boat has been fixed so that a man stepping in the forward part of it would go straight through the bottom. Here, hold on, Marshal. You're going a little too fast for me. Why, it's quite simple. You see, the bottom of this boat is made of several lengths of ordinary board with cross cleats inside and out. Yes, I get that. All right. Three of these boards have been sawn through in two places to make a sort of trap door about three feet square in the fore part of the boat. I don't see any sign of that. No, it was pretty cleverly done. The joints have been fixed up again with wood cement, and it's hard to spot. See, I scraped away a piece of the cement. Yes, I see. Yes, that's right, but how did it work? Well, as far as I can figure, old Pete was accustomed to go out fishing in the pool every night, just about sundown. Whoever did this must have known his habit pretty well. But how did the thing happen? I'm coming to that. This boat was kept moored at the little plank wharf there. Every night, old Pete would take his fishing tackle, go down to the boat. Of course, he'd sit on the cross thwart in the center, with his feet in the stern part, away from where the boards were sawn. I see, but uh, how did they know he'd step on the loose boards? They weren't loose, or at least not loose enough to leak. But never mind that. He'd row out to the middle of the pool... Then he'd anchor and start fishing. How did he anchor the boat? He had this old bar of iron on a rope in the fore part of the boat. I see. When he went to throw out the anchor, he'd step on the loose board. That's eh? it. He'd go down like a shot. And if he was in poor health and couldn't swim, he wouldn't have a chance. But the bottom of the boat is pretty solid, even though those boards are sawn through. Yes, of course. They were put back and screwed down after it happened. See? The screws are all new under this putty stuff. What a devilish thing. Well, it would take quite a time to fix that boat after the thing happened. No, it wouldn't. You see, there's a concrete dam and a railing at the lower end of the pool. The boat and the loose boards would float down and rest against the wire netting. Whoever did it would be all ready. You mean he'd put the boards back, screw them down, and run the putty over the joints, eh? Sure. He'd have the whole board for the screws. It would only take a few minutes. But with this boat floating bottom up, uh, anybody could spot those new joints in the boarding if they looked close enough. No, they couldn't see them. Why, why not? You haven't got it yet, Inspector. When I first got here, I studied this boat for an hour and couldn't see anything wrong with it. Well, it's as plain as can be. The, thing, the thing's too easy. Wait a bit, Inspector. Don't you see there are four cross pieces or cleats on the bottom of this boat? Two of them are still on. I've taken the other two off. That's how I found the new oh. cuts. Yes, I get it. The man that did this took off those cross boards, made the cut in the boards, and then put the cross pieces back and screwed them down. Yes, after the drowning was done. But he left them off until then. But why didn't those loose boards fall out when they were sawn through? I suppose they were just lightly tacked in place. Yes. Well, that's pretty clever. But if the whole thing was covered up, how did you get on to it? Why, it was uh, Mrs. Stewart who started me thinking the boat had oh. been tampered with. Clayton drove her back here at noon. She said the boat looked different somehow. So I started picking round with my penknife and found these new screws. 
That's a very funny thing, Marsh. What, this boat business? Yes. No, I don't mean that. That's just circumstantial stuff. What I mean is that it's queer to get two leads from the same person. It was Fred Sutton's wife who upset his alibi. And now she provides the lead in connection with this boat. Yes, but it was quite unconscious with her. It's funny that she should strengthen the case against her own husband. That's just it. Anyway, Inspector, we've got a strong case against Fred Sutton for the murder of his brother Pete. Don't you agree? About the weight of evidence, yes. We've got enough to hang him. Motive, method and everything. Well, then all we need is a warrant for the arrest of Frederick Sutton. I don't know so much about that, Marshal. If a policeman's job was just to get somebody hanged because a crime has been committed, the case would be complete. But it is complete. Don't you believe that the thing was done by fixing this boat? Yes, that part is clear. And you did a very good piece of detective work, Marshal. Well, then... Hold on a minute, Marshal. I sent you out here because I knew there was something here to find. You have a better head for detail than I have. I don't suppose I'd ever have thought of taking that boat to pieces. You see, I have no mechanical ability. I'm uh, too absent-minded. <laughs> oh, yes. See here, Inspector. That's all very well. But I know you have something up your sleeve. Not very much, Marshal. But I've been looking round. Let's see one of those screws. Here you are. Yes, that's what I thought. It just matches up with the one I found a little while ago. Chad, where did you get that screw, Inspector? Oh, you won't go into that now. It might spoil this good case of yours. See here, Inspector. A joke's a joke. But I'm responsible for this district after all. There's a case against Fred Sutton. Why do you object to picking him up? Because, Marshal, we'd be arresting an innocent man. You've heard the 15th episode in Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the conclusion of the Clover Creek mystery as told in the 16th episode of this series. Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. We present episode 16 in Blair of the Mounties, being part two of the Clover Creek mystery. The little town of Renfield, Saskatchewan, is greatly stirred over the drowning of Pete Sutton. Our story opens at the close of the inquest in the coroner's court. Mr. Foreman of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And what is your verdict? Your Honor, we find that the deceased, Peter James Sutton, met his death by accidental drowning. Listen here, Sergeant. Did you hear that verdict? Yes, I heard it. Well, of course, I'm glad in a way. But didn't you look into things out at Clover Creek? Well, yes. I put in a whole day out there. And you mean to say you didn't find anything? Mr. Sutton, I have nothing to say. See here, Sergeant. I'm going to put in a special request for an inquiry. Go ahead. Do whatever you think best. Why, this is absolutely preposterous. I never heard of such a thing. Hello, Marshal. Did you get through with the inquest? Yes, it's all over. What is the verdict? There could only be one verdict, accidental death. Fine. See here, Inspector, you're an old friend of mine, and you're my superior officer, of course. You know very well that man was murdered. Certainly, Marshal. What of it? The whole thing is ridiculous. Clayton, the lawyer for old Pete, is up in the air. He knows there's something behind this case, and he's talking about a special inquiry. That's going to get us into trouble. Ah, Clayton up in the air, is he? That's interesting. I'm glad you find it interesting. The whole thing is loony to me. What's going to happen if I'm questioned about the facts of our investigation? Wait a minute, Marshal. It's not as bad as that. I take all responsibility for withholding that evidence. Don't worry. But it's going to spoil a good case. You might as well admit it, Inspector. This old Pete Sutton was killed deliberately by his brother, Fred Sutton. You can't get away from it. Marshal, it's time we had an understanding. I don't want to spoil your case. Let's go over the facts from the beginning. Right. The first report we got was that Pete Sutton had been found drowned in the mill pool at Clover Creek. Apparently through the overturning of his boat while fishing. Yes, the place was deserted at the time. His brother Fred Sutton and wife were away at the McDonald Ranch. Apparently both had an alibi. They didn't get back home till midnight. What's next? Then I make up the report as an accidental fatality. 
That was when Clayton, the lawyer, threw a monkey wrench into the accident theory. Be careful with that, Marshal. It's very important. What did he say, as you recall? Why, he came over here as the legal advisor to the deceased man. Felt it his duty to report certain facts to the police. And what were the facts? Simply that Pete Sutton had quarreled with his brother, Fred, a few days before the drowning. Old Pete had given instructions to change his will, cutting his brother out and leaving close on 80,000 to someone else. Yes, but the most important thing was that the new will was waiting in Clayton's office to be signed. Pete Sutton was to come into town yesterday morning to sign it. And the night before, he was drowned. All right. The whole value of Clayton's statement rested on the fact that the drowning of Pete Sutton that night made a difference in his brother's favor of $80,000. What's the answer? The answer is that we have a first-class murder motive with Fred Sutton as the probable criminal, isn't it? Certainly. As far, so far, you and I are in agreement. Well, that's something anyway. Let's get on, Marshal. Next thing is that you go out to the Silver Creek Ranch to look for something that might point to murder. I stay in town. Now, tell me what you found at Clover Creek. It seems rather stupid to be going over these facts again, but of course it's a necessary part of investigation. Well, anyhow, I got to Clover Creek, looked around for a couple of hours without finding a thing. Then I began to study that boat that old Pete went fishing in. Hold on. You had looked at that boat before and found nothing suspicious. What brought you back to it? Mrs. Sutton, of course. Hmm. Fred Sutton's wife. She said the boat looked different somehow. Yes, and what then? I had the boat out on the bank, turned it upside down. It was a homemade boat built of rough board. That's right. Don't let's miss anything. Well, I took those cross pieces off the bottom of the boat and found that the boards had been sawn through underneath in such a way that there was a sort of trap door in the forepart of the boat. Yes. Now let's see if we can form a picture of the actual murder. Let's assume that I'm the murderer. <laughs> well, I've always said you'd make a first-class murderer, Inspector. <laughs> I'd have to be for this job. It's one of the neatest I ever saw. Anyway, I'm the murderer. I'm planning to kill old Pete Sutton. I have that boat fixed. The bottom board's sawn through. I've taken off those cross pieces. The boat's in the water with the front boards loose, but just tight enough to prevent leaking. It's just about sunset, and old Pete's getting ready to go fishing. Quite a thrilling situation. It would be. Well, old Pete goes down to the little plank jetty with his fishing tackle and steps into the boat. Why doesn't he step on those loose boards? That's easy. He sits down on the thwart in the center of the boat with his feet toward the stern. That part of the boat is quite safe. All right. Then he pushes off and rows to the middle of the big pool. He pulls in his oars and gets ready to anchor the boat. The iron bar he uses for an anchor is in the fore part of the boat. He steps over the fort to get it, steps on the loose boards, and down he goes. How's that? That's what happened, without a doubt, Inspector. All right. Then I come along as the murderer. Old Pete is drowned, but I have to fix up the boat to make it look like an accident. Well, you finish the story, Marshal. All right. The boat's still floating, but it's nearly submerged. The loose boards are floating on the surface. The current carries them all down to the concrete dam at the lower end of the pool. Yes. The rest would be easy. It would only take a few minutes to pull the boat to shore, empty out the water, put back those loose boards, and screw the cross pieces into place so they'd cover the places where the boards were sawn. There's only one little thing. What's that? Wouldn't the joins show inside the boat? Why, no. There are cross boards inside, too. I see. Well, then the boat would be shoved out again, bottom up, and the whole thing looks like an accident. Yes, that's the case, Inspector. That's how it was done, and it was Fred Sutton who did it. I don't think so, Marshal. See here, Inspector, that's for the jury to decide. And anyway, if Fred Sutton didn't do it, who did? Take it easy, Marshal, we're coming to that. I had a talk with Fred Sutton yesterday. You did? Yes, he's a very straightforward sort of chap. Answered all my questions without any hesitation. I asked him if he knew about Pete changing his will. What did he say? Oh, he knew about it all right. He said Clayton, the lawyer, tried his best to prevent Pete doing it. Clayton was out at Clover Creek three nights running before the drowning. Fred thinks quite a lot of Clayton. Yeah. He wouldn't think so much of Clayton if he knew he'd tipped us off about that will. Oh, but he does know. I told him. Good Lord. What did he say? Marshal, that fellow is absolutely genuine. He said it was fair enough and that Clayton was only doing his duty. Well, I'm done. Suppose you didn't tell him he was under suspicion. Oh, of course not. But we talked about that boat. About the boat? What did he say? He was quite sincerely puzzled how it came to turn over. You see, uh, he built that boat himself. My good Lord. You mean to say that he admitted that? Certainly. Why shouldn't he? I don't know. It beats me, Inspector. We're not getting anywhere. Unless you turn up something pretty quick, I'll have to arrest Fred Sutton. How about it? No, he doesn't fit the part, Marshal. This murderer was a very smart man, and Sutton isn't smart at all. I think I'll take, take a walk around town. Might uh, find something. But really, sir, this is pretty serious. Clayton is going to file a complaint. He'll be here with the sheriff at two o'clock. You better get back here by then. Ah, that's a nuisance. Doesn't give me much time to find a murderer. Well, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> All right, sir. <laughs> See you at two o'clock. Oh, uh, by the way, Marshal. Yes? 
If the sheriff and Clayton arrive before I get back, you can give them all we have on the case. What, you mean about the boat being fixed and everything? Yes, give them the whole thing. Sergeant, you mean to say you had all this evidence and withheld it at the inquest? That's about the size of it, Sheriff. But that's ridiculous. Well, well, good afternoon, well, Sheriff. Good afternoon, Inspector. Howdy. Inspector. Howdy. Hello, Mr. Clayton. Quite a friendly party. How's the uh, Sutton case coming along? And now, see here, Inspector. Mr. Clayton here, he's a figuring on filing an application for inquiry in this here case. And I says to him... Let's go down and talk it over with Inspector Blair. Very nice of you, I'm sure, George. Sure, sure. All has got along fine with the Mounties, and I ain't looking for no trouble. I know. We're really very nice fellows when you get to know us. Sure. I've been in this game for 40 years now. When I was a young feller, there weren't nobody in this hair country who could touch me for handling criminals. Ain't that right, Inspector? I've uh, often heard you say so, George. Huh? Well, anyway... There's been a kind of a misunderstanding, and we'll come over here to thrash it out. Mr. Clayton here is acting for Pete Sutton as was drowned, and I figure he's entitled to an explanation. Yes, you see, Inspector, I can't understand why you withheld that evidence at the inquest. Wait a minute, Mr. Clayton. There's no need to go into that. I'm, I'm sorry about that inquest, but I wasn't ready to release that information. There were one or two things that weren't quite clear. And it is all settled now? Certainly. Hmm. Marshal gave you that evidence about the boat, didn't he? Yes, I must say it was a clever piece of work. Well, then, you're ready to go ahead on the murder charge? Yes, I'm all ready to make the arrest. Well, in that case, Sheriff, I withdraw that application for uh, inquiry. Fine. There you are now. What to tell you? Just a minute. Now, since there's been a misunderstanding, I, I think we'd better have a little drink, just to show there's no ill feeling, eh? Sure, well, sure. Uh, indeed. Uh, anything in that locker, Marshal? <laughs> yes, yes. Where are those glasses, Inspector? That's all right. I've got them here. Uh, you'll take something, Mr. Clayton? Well, uh, yes, certainly. Here you are, then. George? Thank you, Inspector. All right. Oh, excuse me, but uh, this glass is rather sticky. Oh, sorry. Let me have it. Uh, another glass, Marshal? Yes. Here you are, Mr. Clayton. Try this one. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, Inspector, here's looking at you. Good luck, Good luck everyone. Good luck. Here's to you. Here's to you. better. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll drift along, Mr. Clayton. You'll uh, look after that matter, Inspector? Yes, I'll get a warrant out right away. Marshal will see to the arrest. Uh, good. Then I'll uh, uh, see you later. Sure. Well, did you develop those fingerprints on that uh, sticky glass I gave Clayton? Yes, I got two good sets. Look here, sir, I don't get this at all. What do you want Clayton's prints for? Sit down, Marshal. Let's be serious for a minute. What does one ever want fingerprints for? Just for a check, I suppose. Yes, just for a check. Let's go back to that boat. You remember that second cross piece you took off the bottom of that boat? Yes. Well, you were so busy explaining about those sawn boards you found underneath that you never noticed the fingerprints. Fingerprints? Good Lord. Fingerprints on a wet boat? Yes, the man who fixed that boat was in a hurry. His hands were muddy with pulling the boat out of the water. When he put back that cross piece... He left his prints on the smooth underside. The finest and clearest prints I ever saw. And I am Mr. Never mind that. Here's the photo. How does it check with those of Clayton on the glass? Wait a minute. Okay. What do you know about that? Why, these are Clayton's prints. Certainly. He's your man, Marshal. But that's impossible. Nothing's impossible. Clayton wanted to remove both Pete Sutton and his brother. He and Mrs. Sutton were in it together. He gave us the lead about the motive. She gave you the tip to look at that boat. If he'd put Fred Sutton away, they'd have got that money. Well, I'm done. And I missed those fingerprints. Never mind that, Marshal. Here's the warrant. Go and get Clayton. All right, sir. You have heard the 16th episode of Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the next chapter in this series. A story of dope smuggling in British Columbia.
Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We present the 17th episode in Blair of the Mounties, in which we find Inspector Blair in an entirely new role. Beginning in the early years after the Great War, and steadily increasing through the next decade, the stream of deadly habit-forming drugs from the Orient into Canada and the United States has created a tremendous and baffling problem in crime detection. Assigned to special duty in connection with the drug traffic with headquarters in Vancouver, British Columbia, Blair has requisitioned his friend, Sergeant Marshall, to work with him. Very much worried at being called in to work in which he has no experience, we find Sergeant Marshall, as our scene opens, entering the office in Vancouver with his chief. There you are, Marshall. This is where we work. But this is a business office. Well, yes, I hope so, Marshall. But I don't see the idea. What's that name on the door? United Equity Company. Why, don't you like it? Why, yes, the name's all right. I'm glad you like it. Uh, you see, I invented it myself. Eh? Very appropriate. Equity is another name for justice. Get the idea? <laughs> yeah, but don't you have any trouble with callers? Oh, not particularly. Miss Guest handles that. Miss Guest? Yes, you'll have to meet her. She's over in Victoria today. Very efficient lady. Knows all about the drug business, speaks Oriental languages, worth her weight in gold. I see. Oh, she's in the service. Yes, very interesting woman. you like her. Look here, Inspector, I want to talk to you about this job. Fine, sit down, Marshal. How's everything in Renfield? Oh, quiet, as usual. How's my old friend George Redmond, the sheriff? <laughs> Same as ever. You know, I was rather glad to get away from George. Ever since that Sutton case, he's been a nuisance. How do you mean? Well, you know George. To hear him talk, you'd think he was the one that first got on to Clayton. <laughs> Good old George. But you're looking worried, Marshal. What's the trouble? Oh, it's this dope business. You know, Inspector, it's a highly technical game, and I don't know the first thing about it. Excellent. Yes, but listen, Inspector. It's a highly specialized business. A man has to be an expert. I've been 18 years in police work now. But when it comes to the drug traffic, I know less about it than the average city cop. So that's the trouble, is it? Yes, that's the trouble. That's funny. You know, three months ago, when I was assigned to this work, I was called to Ottawa to see the commissioner. He's a pretty big man, Marsh. I'll say he is. That's why I took a chance when I went in to see him. I came out flat-footed and told him I thought he was making a big mistake. You what? Yes, I told him I didn't know a solitary thing about the drug traffic. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, he just laughed. Said that was just why he'd picked me. Sounds a bit contradictory. Yes, that's how it looked to me at first. But the more I've thought about it since, the more I agree with him. Hmm, well, I hope you're right, Inspector. On that basis, I ought to be a first-class choice. But I don't follow that sort of reasoning. Look here, Marshal. The trouble of the world today, and modern police work in particular is that everybody's trying to be too smart and technical. Well, but one has to move with the time. In a way, yes. But look at the Mounted Police as an organization. We're rather an old-fashioned lot when you come to think of it. You mean the uniform, red coats, stats and hats and all that sort of thing? Yes, that's part of it. But it goes deeper than that. Our system is still the simple old-fashioned style. Yet, the old force still keeps up a pretty good reputation for results. Yes. I've often wondered about it myself. The answer is, Marsh, that human nature is the most important thing in crime detection. Whether a criminal uses a knife or an automatic pistol, whether he makes it get away with a dog sled or a high-powered car, he's still the same sort of human machine with the same kind of a brain. Yes, I see. Yes, there's something in that. There's everything in it. Look at modern police work in general, with filing systems, scientific methods, and all that sort of stuff. And look at the criminals who get away. In a way, that's true. And look at modern trial systems, expert witnesses, psychiatrists, murder trials lasting for weeks. In the old days, it generally took a few hours. Well, but things were simpler then. Simpler, yes, but no easier. Just think of the old organization in the Northwest. Handful of policemen, a couple of judges, and a hangman. They wouldn't have known a psychiatrist from a load of hay. But they knew a criminal when they saw one. Well, we're getting off the point. We have a lot of work to do. Anything special? Yes, there's a lot of dope filtering into the U.S. from the Orient lately. Mostly through Seattle. What's that got to do with us? Now, the U.S. authorities claim it's coming in through Canada. Hmm. Just passing the buck, eh? No, I don't think so. They have some pretty good men on the job down there. And their system's ahead of ours. Certainly looks as if the bulk shipments come in here and are broken up for distribution across the border. The distributing plan seems to be somewhere up here. Hmm. Any suspects? Yes, we have one or two. I'll talk about that later. Frankly, Inspector, I feel utterly helpless in starting this work. 
Surely there's some technical knowledge necessary. Oh, of course. Don't misunderstand me, Marshal. In the running down of peddlers and all that sort of work, the city police forces are very efficient. And in searching ships and so on, the customs people have plenty of good men working. We've nothing to do with that. Then what in the world is our job, Inspector? The toughest of all. We have to go after the men behind the racket, if we can find them. Now I begin to see. Yes. We have an idea that the people who are financing and directing this work are pretty high up, probably very respectable. Sort of society job. Possibly. And now let me give you a few instructions. First of all, we're strictly undercover in this work. Plain clothes all the time. Know anybody out here? Oh, one or two friends. I'm afraid you'll have to keep away from them for the present, at least. All right, that's easy. What's the first job? Oh, nothing definite yet. I'm interested in a Mr. Abraham Parker. Suspected? Yes, he's our number one suspect at present. Leads a very respectable life. He's a director in the Fortuna Mining and Development Company. Offices in this building. I see. Where are the mining properties? Oh, there aren't any that I know of. This company has a new method for prospecting, sort of instrument for finding minerals. They seem to have plenty of money to spend and do their traveling by seaplane a good deal. Sounds interesting. Yes, it may not be anything, but I'm checking up on Mr. Parker. His movements are very puzzling. Got anything on him? Not a thing, except our tip from the U.S. authorities. They claim he's been connected with suspicious rackets in the States and Mexico, but they've never been able to get anything on him. Pretty vague business, Inspector. Yes, it's vague, all right. This fellow moves in good society up here. Since he came to Canada, he's been left strictly alone. Just to see what happened. Where is he now? Right here in this building. That's what puzzles me. Don't follow you, Inspector. All right, I'll explain. He left here a few days ago for Victoria. Left there by the boat that goes up the west coast of the island. Takes several days to make the round trip. But he landed back here 12 hours after he started out on that boat. Well, isn't there some other boat connection? No, of course he came back by plane. But I'm interested in the place he got off on Vancouver Island. It should be possible to find that out. Of course. But remember, we're working alone in this business. I don't want to cause any excitement by checking up through police channels. Miss Guest went over to Victoria yesterday. She's a regular ferret. But so far, I haven't heard from her. Well, I must say, Inspector, you and I have been on some strange jobs, but this is the limit. Sending a woman out to check up on a suspect. That's a new one on me. Yes, it is a little novel. But bear in mind, Marshal, we lead the life of tourists. Don't go near police stations or telegraph offices, except in emergency. You've got to learn to be terribly unofficial. Very well, sir. Why, hello. Good afternoon, Miss Guest. Good afternoon, Inspector. Ah. Now, see here, Miss Guest. What did I tell you about official titles? Oh, dear, I'm sorry. Well, don't do it again. This is my friend, Marshal, Miss Guest. How, How do, do you do, do Mr. Marshal? Hope you'll have a pleasant holiday with us. Uh, what? A holiday? Uh, uh, oh, 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 yes, yes, of course. Thanks very much. Fine, that's the stuff, Marshal. Well, Miss Guest, any news? Yes, Parker got off at Kittilat Harbour. Kittilat, I see. Where's that? It's only a little way north of Victoria on the west coast of the island. There's a small hotel there. Kittilat, yes. That sounds interesting. Anything else? Yes, he called on Commander Richford at Kittilat. And who is Commander Richford? He's a retired naval officer. Very eccentric, they say. Lives in an old house on Kittilat Lagoon with his daughter. Mm. I have a letter of introduction to Miss Richford. Nice work, Miss Guest. That means, I suppose, that you're planning a trip to Kittilat, eh? Well, of course, if you think it's necessary. Certainly, we'll all go. They say there's good fishing in Kittilat Lagoon. I think it's an excellent idea. The boat leaves Victoria tomorrow morning at eight. Fine. Get the transportation, Miss Guest. Remember, we're all strangers to each other. We get acquainted on the boat. Now, Marshal, we'll go uptown and get you some tourist clothes and fishing tackle. You mean that, sir? Certainly, and not so much of the sir. Oh, we're just a friendly party, going to have a nice little time up at Kittilat. And uh, don't forget your music, Miss Guest. Marshall's quite a singer. But see here, Inspector... Uh, oh, hang it all. Uh, when do we go over this case? Plenty of time for that, Marshall. Come on. Better straighten up in the office, Miss Guest. We'll see you at the boat. Bravo, Marshal, that's fine. Come over here, you two, and look at this view. Yes, isn't it gorgeous? All right, keep up the conversation. I suppose that's where your friends live, Miss Guest. Yes, that's the house across the lagoon. Quite a big place, apparently. 
See that girl coming up the steps? She's from that house. Then they got my message. Yes, keep talking, Marshal. Hey, George, look at those fish jumping. We ought to get some good sport tomorrow. Oh, yes, I'm going to try that new spinner of mine. Excuse me, are you Miss Guest? Yes, and you're Miss Richford, aren't you? Yes, I got your note, and it was kind of you to come. And these are two gentlemen I met on the boat, Mr. Blair and Mr. Marshall. How do you do? How, do you do? How are you, Miss Richford? Uh, you have a beautiful place, Miss uh, Richard. Uh, yes, it, it is lovely here, isn't it? Uh, are you staying long at Kidlat, Miss Guest? Oh, I never know, my dear. Traveling's my hobby, you see. I'll stay till the next boat comes back anyhow. Perhaps longer. I see. I'm so sorry I can't invite you all to the house. You see, my father's practically an invalid, and we never entertain. Oh, please don't trouble about that. My friend and I are thinking of trying the fishing in the morning, Miss Richford. I understand the stream and your private grounds is a good place for trout. I wonder if we might presume on so slender an acquaintance uh, to... Uh... Really, I, I don't know... You mustn't misunderstand me, but my father is a, a, a little peculiar. I laugh. Oh, don't trouble him. By the way, I met a friend of your father's in Vancouver. Uh, Mr. Parker, oh. his name was. Fortuna Mining Company. Oh, yes. I, I know him slightly. Oh, really, Miss Guest, if you don't mind, I'll have to get back. My father needs attention constantly, and I'm afraid I must go. Certainly, my dear, I understand. I'll come down to the boat with you. Oh, no, no, please. Don't bother. I'll run back sometime tomorrow. Well, I'm done. What's the matter with that girl? Careful, Marshal. Somebody listening. Say something, Miss Guest. Hey. Marshal, there's something here. That girl was frightened to death when I mentioned Parker. Yes, I, I noticed that. Careful of these people in the hotel. Where's your gun? In my pocket. All right. Be sure it's working. Tomorrow we'll get out on the boat where we can talk. And tomorrow night, I'm going to find out what's in that house over there. You have heard episode 17 in Blair of the Mounties. For the conclusion of this story, tune in for episode 18 of this series. Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We present episode 18 in Blair of the Mounties, being the second and concluding part of Kittilat Lagoon. Our story finds Inspector Blair and Sergeant Marshall on the west coast of Vancouver Island engaged in the investigation of dope smuggling. Posing as tourists, Blair, Marshall, and the very efficient Miss Guest of the Special Service are staying at the little hotel at Kittilat Harbour. Our story opens out on the lagoon, where Blair and Marshall are enjoying a morning's quiet fishing. Chad, I, I thought I had that one. Gee, he was a beauty, too. <laughs> Always keep your line taut until the fish is landed, Marshal. <laughs> What's that, another piece of philosophy, sir? Well, yes, come to think of it, the same thing applies to catching criminals. Very like fishing. Needs a lot of patience. Well, let's lay off a bit and go over this case. You know, of all the jobs I was ever in on with, uh, with you, this is the most intangible I ever remember. Why, I don't see anything in it. And yet you'll admit there's something wrong here. Well, yes, <laughs> probably bootlegging. Maybe, but I think it's something more than that. But just consider this place. Why, it's only a few hours from Victoria. And yet it's pretty isolated. Only one boat a week, and then consider its geographical position. You mean close to the track of ships from the Orient? Yes, that's it. And yet, they'd have to divert their course to get near this harbor. That would mean that the ship's owners were on the dope smuggling game. No, I don't think that's the case. The stuff is usually smuggled by men in the crew. Well, they couldn't smuggle a very big quantity in that case. Not of opium, no. But now that cocaine is running heavily, it's different. It's highly concentrated. A couple of hundred thousand dollars worth can be dropped overboard in waterproof packages, fastened to a buoy. A motorboat can run out from a place like this and get it without much trouble. Yes, I see. Do you really think this is the headquarters this man Parker is using? I have an idea. It is, Marshal. I didn't expect to stumble on the thing so soon. But I believe we're going to run into something big here. And you better give me the lineup. Yes, that's what I began to do just now. First, there's this man Parker. We were tipped off that he's the man behind the dope racket. He's running this Fortuna Mining Company in Vancouver. I've watched him for three months. 
and got nothing on him except that he uses a seaplane and his movements have been hard to follow. Ah, you think this mining business is a blind? I don't know yet. There are some very respectable people interested in the venture. He might have a genuine business and still use it as a screen for criminal activities. People who invest money don't often worry how profits are made. Yes, I get the idea. But how about this old uh, Commander Richford? There's another phase of the thing. The old chap's eccentric. Has this big house and estate up here and keeps everybody off his property. Miss Guest's theory is that he's a tool of Parker's. She thinks Parker may be using the house as a headquarters. I will say that Miss Guest seems to know her stuff. You know, she's as sharp as a needle. That's right. First time I ever worked with a woman in the detective business. But she knows the dope racket inside out. Anyway, this thing is beginning to fit together. It might be what we're after, Marshal. Yes, it could be all right. Of course it could. This place is ideal. Hardly any people up here except a few Indians. They could pick up that stuff at sea by night and run it in here. Then the seaplanes could run it from here inland. It's only an hour's flying time to the U.S. border. The thing's plausible, all right. The suspicious way these people act at the hotel certainly looks bad. And then that girl yesterday, the commander's daughter, she was frightened to death when asked about fishing on her father's place. We'll have to find some way of looking around that house, Marshal. Yes. Maybe Miss Guest will have an idea. Here she comes, back from her morning call. Oh, yes. Yeah. But she certainly had her nerve calling at that place this morning after the broad hint she got to keep away. She has the nerve, all right. After all, they couldn't chase her off with a shotgun exactly. No. Well, here she comes. Yeah. Hello. Any luck? Not bad. What about you? Oh, I had quite a successful morning. Rather funny. Miss Richford was quite cordial with me. I saw her father, too. Here, wait a minute, Miss Guest. You mean you got into that house? Of course. Had a long talk with the girl. She was very apologetic for her discourtesy yesterday and seemed very anxious to make amends. Mm. And I got a warm invitation for you both to go and fish in the stream near the house. Miss Richford said the evening is the best time, just before sunset. Well, I'll be jiggered. That's fine. We'll be able to have a look round. See anything suspicious, Miss Guest? Just a couple of things, but they're very important. What are they? I told you that I saw the girl's father, Commander Richmond. He came in suddenly as we were talking. Of course, she introduced me. What's he like? He's an invalid, she said. I wouldn't call him an invalid, and yet, in a way, it's true. Just what do you mean? I mean that he's in perfectly good health, except he's an addict. Good Lord, you mean he's a drug yes, addict? he has all the indications. Why, Joe, that's mm. something. What was the other thing? That was queerer still, in a way. Somebody must have come over from Vancouver by plane during the night. What? How on earth do you figure that? Well, there was a newspaper in the house, the Vancouver province, yesterday's date. It's an afternoon paper, and there's been no boat since yesterday morning. Now, that's what I call observation. Oh, Miss Guest never misses those sort of things. Oh, but that was simple. What's the plan, Inspector? Let's talk it over. I wonder why they turned so friendly over there at the house. Any theory, Marshal? Well, no, I'd rather not do any guessing. Unless it was that the old man was afraid the girl's conduct yesterday might have caused suspicion. That might be. What do you think, Miss Guest? Well, there's that point of the Vancouver newspaper. If anyone came here by plane last night, it may be that they removed any evidence that might have been there yesterday. And now there's no need for keeping us away. You mean they might have taken a load out last night? Yes. That sounds more like it. Then again, it may be a neat little trap. That sounds still more likely. Even so, we've got to go through with it now. They may have a surprise all ready for us tonight. I suppose the Dominion of Canada can afford to lose a couple of policemen. What do you say, Marshal? Fair enough, Inspector. Do you think they're onto our business? Oh, really? To tell you the truth, this thing is developing faster than I expected. I was quite prepared to put in weeks of observation work before we really got anything. And, of course, the whole thing may turn out to be a fizzle. Of course, we really haven't got anything definite at all. Yet. Only a series of very strange coincidences that take a lot of explaining. We've got to break into this thing... And test out these theories. We might stay here a month and never get any farther ahead by just watching the place. Couldn't you put in a report and wait for orders? Yeah, that'd be all right. But I'm a little afraid we've aroused suspicion here already. And in that case, there's no time to be lost. I think that's true. It may already be too late. All right, we'll go back to lunch. This afternoon, we'll try that trout stream by the house and keep our eyes open. Tonight, Marshal, you and I will go back there and see if we can find anything. All right, start that motor, Marshal. Right on. Which way, Inspector? Work round to the back of the house. There's a building on the other side that I want to look at. Careful where you step. Yes. Get it's pretty dark. Hmm. 
That place beyond is the boathouse, I believe. Yes, evidently. But I want to see what's in it. All right. Here you go. Here. Here you are. Here. There's a path here. I see. Why, George, they, they seem pretty quiet at the house. Yes. What time is it, Marshal? Close on two o'clock. They must be all in bed by this time. Unless there's a watchman on the job. No, we've got a chance, that. It's funny. There isn't even a dog to give the alarm. I don't understand that. No. Here. Here's that boathouse, anyway. There's a door here that... But it's padlocked. And here... Here's a window. All right. Try the flashlight. Better keep it down low. Yes. Look. There's a big boat in there. I see. A power cruiser. It looks like... A fast one. See those side exhausts? Yes. Well, that makes the thing more plausible. But there's no law against keeping a motorboat. Let's get back to the house. What? You're going to try to get in? Yes. Might as well find out all we can while we're here. Say, it'd be funny if we got pinched for burglary. Yes, wouldn't it? Shall we try one of these windows? Hold on. Wait a minute. There's a basement door here. This way, Marshal. My gosh, the thing's open. Better be careful, Inspector. This is too easy. Either there's nothing at all here, or a lot more than we bargain for. Well, come on. We've got to look round. Here, Marshal, what on earth? Switch that light off. Stand still, both of you, and don't move. Parker, by all that's infernal. Yes, Parker's the name, Inspector Blair. I was expecting you. Better keep still. This gun might go off. All right. What are you going to do, Parker? Won't you sit down, Inspector? And your friend, too. <laughs> I'd like to tell you something about my business. Your business? Well, that's what you came for, isn't it? All right. What about it? It might interest you to know that I've been checking up on this little scheme of yours very closely. When I heard that the famous Inspector Blair was on the job, naturally, I had to take precautions. Really? Yes. I thought you were going to cause me a lot of trouble, but I'm afraid your ability is a good deal overrated. What's the point of all this, Parker? The point, Inspector, is that you fitted into our little arrangement very nicely. When I gave you that lead to this place, I never dreamed that you'd bite so hard. I see. You mean the time you took the boat up here instead of coming in by plane? Yes, I should have seen through that. Well, what are you going to do, Parker? That ought not to be hard to guess, Inspector. A lot of men in your line have tried to meddle with this business of mine. I've always tried to cooperate with them. Detectives are very fond of clues, so I give them plenty. That's my system. Get the idea? Yes. Congratulations, Parker. It's a new angle. I'll uh, bear it in mind. I'm afraid you won't have very long to think it over, Inspector. The plane is just coming in from Vancouver for our nightly shipment. Hmm. I'm going to take you, gentlemen, for a little ride. You'll see our business in operation before we part. <laughs> Very neat, Parker. Do you expect to get away with this? Well, why not? I'm particularly pleased you brought Miss Guest along. My man has gone to the hotel for her now. Well, she's a very clever woman, and the party wouldn't be complete without Miss Guest. I must say, you don't appear to have overlooked anything. Thanks. Praise from Inspector Blair <laughs> is praise indeed. Here, Parker. What's the meaning of this? Get out of here, Richford, you blundering fool. Put that gun down, Get Parker. out, I tell you. Put that gun down. Uh, uh. Quick, Marshal. Uh, all right. Parker's got it. Got it through the head. How's the commander? He's badly hit. They were within two feet of each other when they fired. This fellow's alive. Let's get a statement. Uh, Commander, listen. Sorry. Sorry, gentlemen. It's... It's no good. Tell me, you might as well. Were you associated with this man here? Yes. Yes, I... I was... I was... In it. But I... I draw the line at... At... Killing policemen. He's gone, I'm afraid. 
Well, this is a nice mess. Wonder what that shooting is outside. I don't know, Inspector. Look out. That's somebody coming. All right, stand by. Hey, stand still there. Put your hands up. Oh, it's only me, Sergeant. <laughs> Good Lord, Miss Guest. <laughs> yes. Is anybody hurt? Yes, Parker and Commander Richford. They killed each other. Oh, dear, how terrible. What was that shooting outside just now? Well, you see, there's a seaplane just landed out there. So I took an awful chance. I blew a hole in the floater in my automatic. Hmm. I'm afraid that it's sinking, Inspector. Did I do right? Huh, Miss Guest, that was very unladylike of you. You have heard episode 18 of Blair of the Mounties. The next chapter in the series is entitled Robbery at the Canada Western. Blair of the Mounties, the story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We present the 19th episode in Blair of the Mounties. <laughs> Inspector Blair's old friend Angus McGregor, one time Hudson's Bay factor at Fort McAllister, is now retired from service and is living in Vancouver. Our scene opens in the dusk of a summer evening. As the darkness gathers over the quiet waters of English Bay, we find Blair and Angus talking together in the garden of the McGregor home. Weel, new inspector. <laughs> it was mighty good of you to <laughs> drop in the next day. I didn't expect you. Why not, Angus? Well, I was just reading the paper about the bank robbery in the city. I was thinking you'd be busy. <laughs> That's nothing to do with me. Thank goodness. <laughs> what? Are you no working today? Oh, yes, in a way, but crime in the city of Vancouver has nothing to do with us, unless we're invited to lend a hand. All we do nowadays is loaf round and look important. We're known in the guidebooks as the picturesque survival of other days. <laughs> well, well, just think of that new. <laughs> Uh, but, Mon Inspector, it's a very bad case. Would you no know, like to be reading the report? No, thanks. Had enough of bank robberies 20 years ago in Winnipeg. One of the queerest cases I ever ran across. Hmm, aye, aye. We knew it's, it's a fine next for a story. <laughs> Inspector, you know, I'm awful fond of mysteries <laughs> myself. <laughs> Angus, you're the most inquisitive old humbug I ever knew. <laughs> oh, well, here goes. You remember the old uh, Canada Western Bank in Winnipeg? Mm, I, I mind that wheel on Portage Avenue. That's it. I was stationed in Winnipeg then. It was the spring of 1904. I was a sergeant at the time. Marshall was there too. One morning he came bursting into the office when I was working on the report. Sergeant, sergeant, have you heard the news? News? No. For heaven's sake, shut that door. All right. But listen, sergeant. There's been a robbery at the Canada Western Bank. Over a hundred thousand in currency. I don't care if they robbed fifty banks. What's that got to do with us? The job for the city police. But hold on, Inspector. They've arrested old Danny McBrennan. Uh, you know him, don't you? No, old Danny, rather. He used to be in the police. What on earth did they arrest Danny for? Well, he's the night watchman at the bank. They suspect him of complicity. Suspect old Danny? Why, that's ridiculous. Well, they've got him anyway. And Mason, the cashier, too. That's too bad, Marshal. I'd take my oath old Danny would never do a thing like that. That's what I think, too. Hold on a minute. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. Good morning. Canada Weston? Yes. Marshal just told me. No. No, I don't understand it either. Maybe it's some mistake. Yes. Yes, I'll do that, sir. By the way. Marshal. Yes? We're on this case. The inspector's just given me instructions to go down to jail and see Danny. He used to be in our outfit and we've got to help him. I see. Yes, it'd be a nasty crack for us if they convict Danny. We'd never hear the last of it. What do you know about this case? Any details? Just a few. Last night at 11 o'clock, the cashier, Mason, was working late at the bank. He lives in the rooms above the bank anyway. All right. What about Danny? I was coming to that. About 11.05, Danny states that a man got out of a cab and walked across the pavement to the main door. Where was Danny? Outside on the corner. He was making his rounds. He, did he identify this man? Sure. 
He says it was the manager, Blake Fishborough. Fishborough, yes, I know him. What then? Fishborough gave Danny a $10 bill and asked him to run along to the Craven Hotel and get him some cigars. That's practically all Danny's story. Well, what happened? The cashier, Mason, says that Fishborough came into the bank. He was wearing a heavy coat with a collar turned up. He told Mason to clear out and get to bed right away. Mason says the manager gave him the devil for being there so late. And then what? Why, when Danny got back, the manager had gone. He went upstairs and got Mason. Then Mason spotted a package of important bonds lying near the vault with a paper torn partly off one package. That made him suspicious. He opened the safe and found the currency gone. Well, but what does the manager say? He isn't in town. Skipped out? No, that's the funny part. He left for Portage de Prairie yesterday afternoon's train. He's on his way back now. The cast iron alibi. Quite sure about that? Not a chance of, of any doubt. At 11 o'clock last night, Blake Fishborough was attending a farewell supper in Portage. All the prominent people in town were there. It's a dead sure alibi. All right, let's go down and talk to Danny. This way, Sergeant. Morning, Danny. Good morning to you, Sergeant. Well, since I hear about you, Danny, robbing banks, getting your name in the papers, I'm surprised at you. Ah, don't be making a joke of it, Sergeant. Sure, it's bad enough without that. Come on now, Danny. Brace up, my lad. Don't suppose anybody in the old crowd will ever believe this on you. We're all with you, Danny. We'll get you out of here if we have to start a war. Nah, it's fine to be talking, Sergeant, but there's there's nothing you can do. Let's have your story anyway, Danny. Ah, sure, it's not much use. I've told it three times already. It's so crazy, I'd hardly believe it myself. Come on, Danny. I want that story just as it happened. Start at the beginning. Well, all right. It was exactly five past eleven. I came out of the alleyway at the side of the bank. Where have you been? Well, just on my usual rounds. I start at eleven with the outside of the building, checking the doors and fire escapes. It takes about five minutes. All right. What happened when you came out of the alley? Begorry, there was a cab just thrown up, and Mr. Fishbury gets out of it. And I hurried up to meet him right at the front door. Be careful, Danny. You sure it was the manager? Of course. I take me day and north on it. He had a heavy coat on with a collar turned up. But I saw his face, and I heard the voice of him. Sure, now, don't I know him all of the seven years? All right, what, Nick? Well, then he pulled out a tin-dollar bill, and he says to me, Danny, he says... I'm going into the office for a while. Go along to the Craven House and get me a half a dozen of them long tom cigars. The Craven House? That'd be quite a way from the bank, eh? Sure, twelve blocks it is now, and me walking. But it's the only place they keep them cigars. How long did it take you? Oh, it was uh, twenty-five after eleven when I got back to the bank. And uh, when I got back, where the office was all dark and not a sign of the manager. What did you do then? Well, I thought he must be upstairs in Mr. Mason's the cashier's room, so I went up. Mason was just getting ready for bed when I told him the manager was gone. He wouldn't believe me, and we both busted downstairs into the bank. And what do you find there? Nothing at first. Then Mason spotted a bundle of papers. Bonds they were, just by the door of the vault. He picked them up. That was when he tumbled out that the vault had been opened. I see. So he reopened the vault, eh? Uh, that's right, Sergeant. And then he called me. Uh, there was bonds and papers strewn all over the floor. Oh, it was a devil of a mess, it was. No time lock on that vault? No, there's a talk of putting one on in. Well, most of the banks have them now, but uh, there's never been one in the old Canada Western. How many people know the combination? Uh, just Mr. Fishbury and Mess. I see. It's a bad spot for you, Danny. Aye. But I still don't see what right they have to arrest you. There's no tangible evidence against you. Just one thing, Sergeant. What is that? That tin dollar bill Mr. Fishbury gave me for the cigars. It was a brand new bill. It was one of the bunch that was supposed to have been put into the vault yesterday afternoon. Ah, I see. So the theory is that you and Mason opened the vault and got that money last night. Why, that's crazy. That may be crazy, but it's pretty hard to get away from that bill. Ah, bad cess to it. This is the truth you're telling me, Danny? May I never speak a word again, Sergeant. It's the whole truth. And you're sure it was Blake Fishborough, the manager, you saw at the bank last night? I'd stake my life on it. And yet there are 30 or 40 prominent people who could swear that he was in Port of Prairie at 11 o'clock last night. It's certain he's here th there this morning. He must have been there, Danny. Aye, it looks that way. But I tell you, I saw him here last night. They never believe you, Danny. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. All right. Marshal's having a talk to Mason, the cashier. I've got to go now, Danny. Cheer up now. We'll find a way to get you out of this. Thank you for trying anyway, Sergeant. Marshal. Yes, Sergeant? Get anything important? Afraid not. Just the same thing over again with a few more details. What do you think of this man, Mason, the cashier? Hang it, I know. His story's straight enough. It fits in with Danny's story about the manager, Fishbury, coming in just after 11 o'clock. 
He says the manager called him down for being in the bank at that hour. That he went straight up to his quarters, leaving the manager in the office. Yes, hard to start a theory. Why should these two men invent that story? It's such a poor defense. The most impossible thing they could have thought of. Which, of course, is all in their favor. This cashier was in trouble. Old money in oh. large amounts. He had the combination of the safe. Yes, I wouldn't pay much attention to his story alone, but I can't get round Danny. He's a simple-minded old fellow with a tremendous sense of duty. Can't see him as a criminal accessory at all. I believe he's absolutely positive he saw this manager. And yet, the manager was in Portage at the time. By the way, did you see him just now? Yes, he's back. I had to talk to him. He seems like a man in a dream. There's no doubt about that alibi. At 11 o'clock, he was making a speech in full view of 30 or 40 people who've known him for years. Did you ask him about this statement of Danny's? Yes, but he just smiled at me in a puzzled way. I felt rather foolish. Because, Marsh, there's no getting away from it. That man was in Portage last night and not at the bank. Yes, there's no getting away from that. Take it the other way round. Question of identity here at the bank. Yes, it's just as certain at this end. Even if Danny made a mistake, Mason the cashier saw the man in the light and talked to him. Also, he had the combination of the vault. We don't know that, Marshal. Suppose Danny made a mistake, but Mason didn't. Oh, you mean it might have been a confederate of Mason's who fooled Danny? No, that's no use. If Mason wanted to rob the bank, why would he need a confederate? That's true. Another thing. I can't get over the finding of that package of bonds outside the vault. And what puzzles me still more is the disorder in the vault itself. That seems to favor Mason. Why is that? Can you imagine any trained bank official throwing stuff around like that? Not unless he was done on purpose. It doesn't make sense. Any theory, Sergeant? Yes. There's only one that would fit this case and explain everything. But it needs just one little link of some sort before I'd even talk about it. Hello? Who's this? Why, hello, Bridget. What's the matter? Oh, I just come from seeing Danny. Is there anything you can do to save him? We're doing our best, Bridget. Oh, but he never done it, Mr. Blair. You know that. Sure, and I ran all the way from Mr. Fishbury's when I heard Mr. it. Mr. Fishbury's? What are you doing there? Oh, don't you know? I'm his housekeeper. Him being a bachelor and all. I go into work there every day. That's interesting. Did you see him last night? No, sir. Not after I packed his things to go to Portage. Hmm. Did he take a big fur-lined coat with him? Aye. It's funny. He took three suits of clothes and two overcoats. Three? Uh, here, hold on. What were they? Well, there was the clothes he was wearing, and then his dress clothes, and the suit he wears to the bank in the day joy. Did you pack that one? Sure I did. I don't know why. Holy smoke, that's got it. What is it, Sergeant? That's what I wanted. We've got him. Come on, hurry up, Marshal. Well, for mercy's sake. You have heard episode 19 of Blair of the Mountains. The second and concluding part of this story will be told in episode 20 of this series. Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We present the 20th episode in Blair of the Mounties, being the second part of the story of the Canada Western Bank robbery. In the first part of our story, news of the robbery of over $100,000 in currency breaks. Two men are arrested on suspicion. Mason, the bank cashier, and old Danny McBrennan, the night watchman, an ex-member of the Mounties. Blair goes into action in defense of old Danny. As our scene opens, we find Blair and Marshall discussing the case at police barracks. But, Sergeant... Do you mean to say that you have the solution to this thing? Yes, I've got the solution. And you know who did it? Yes, I know who did it. Well, but I don't follow all this. Now, have a little patience, Marshal. I've given the lead to the city police. It's their job, you see. And if my idea works out, we ought to know something in a little while. In the meantime, let's go over the whole case. Perhaps you'll see what I'm driving at. Now, uh, what happened first? And mind you, don't miss the little thing. The first thing was that Danny McBrennan, night watchman at the bank, states that at 11.05 last night... The manager, Blake Fishbury, drove up to the bank in a cab. Anything suspicious in that statement? Well, not suspicious, but unreasonable. 
Fishborough was proved to be out of town at that time, attending a public function where lots of prominent people saw him. And what do you conclude from that? That Danny was either lying or that he was mistaken. Or that he wasn't mistaken and wasn't lying. But, but, but that's impossible. Well, we'll pass that up for the present. What's the next item in Danny's statement? He said that the bank manager gave him a $10 bill, sent him to the Craven Hotel for some cigars. The Craven House is 12 blocks away from the bank, and it took Danny 20 minutes. Yes. Now we switch over to the statement of Mason, the cashier. He was working late in the bank. He too swears that Fishborough, the manager, came in at about five past eleven and chased him off to bed. Mason immediately went upstairs to his quarters over the bank, or so he says. It's funny that neither of these men remarked on their surprise at seeing the manager back from his trip. Bravo, Marshal, that's an important point. It brings up a possibility, but we'll pass that one too. Let's get on. What next? The next thing is that Danny gets back with the cigars and finds the manager gone. That makes him suspicious. He goes upstairs and gets Mason, the cashier. Mason spots a package of bonds that must have come out of the safe, opens the vault, and finds the currency gone. All right. The city police arrest both Danny and Mason on suspicion. What's the case against them? The case against Mason is that he knew the combination of the vault. He slept above the bank and had no alibi. In fact, he admits being there at the time. Yes, now the case against Danny. The case against Danny looks bad. The $10 bill he claims the manager gave him for the cigars was one that had been put into the vault when it was closed that afternoon. It's a mixed-up business. Yes, anyhow, here's Andy McCross of the city police in a deuce of a hurry. Let's hear what he has to say. Good morning. Hello, Mac. What can I do for you? You can give me an explanation. The whole city's swarming with mounties checking up on the Canada Western you case. Don't tell me. You better call him off or there's going to be trouble. You, me call him off? Well, I'm not running the force, Mac. No, but you're at the bottom of all this foolery. I tell you, we got that night watchman Danny McBrennan cold and Mason too. They're remanded for trial at the assizes. So I heard. Well, you see, Mac, Danny used to belong to our lot. And naturally, the boys are out to do what they can. But if you have a case against them, of course, it's all right. Now, what's wrong with the case, anyway? Better sit down, Mac. We were just talking it over. What do you think of this story that Mason and Danny told? You mean about the manager himself stealing that money and giving Danny the ten dollar bill for the cigar? Yes. You don't mean to tell me you believe that story. I do, Mac. Oh, the thing's ridiculous. Yes. Too ridiculous to be a lie. What do you mean? Just think it over, Mac. Mason the cashier is a pretty smart chap. If he was cooking up a story, it's funny he wouldn't think up a better one than that. I don't see anything funny in it. All right, we'll have the best lawyer in Canada to defend old Danny. Wait till he starts on that case of yours. I have an idea you'll see the joke. See here, Sergeant. Have we not always worked with you before now? Yes, I know what's coming, Mac. All good policemen should stick together. Well, eh? but no... Now, forget it, Mac. That stuff is out. We're working for Danny. I was bluffing just now when I talked about hiring a lawyer. That won't be necessary. Why not? Because I think we're going to have this case cleaned up before night. And Danny will be a free man. No, see here, Sergeant. If you have a line on anybody for this thing, I have a right to know it. I wouldn't be too sure of that, Mac. But I'm sure of it. And another thing... You've got 50 men out on this watching the roads and the trains out of the city and checking up hotels. And if you don't pull them off, there'll be a complaint into the commissioner of a noon from the mayor of the city. See here, Andy McCross. You try to pull that comic policeman stuff on me, I'll make you and your whole outfit look like 30 cents before the day's out. But hold on now. What's the trouble? The trouble is the arrest of Danny McBrennan. He was in the police. There's a dozen or more of us here on this station that served with Danny through the storm and the cold up in the Arctic. Danny never told a lie in his life. You've got a nerve to arrest a man like Danny. Oh, no, I begin to see. Well, don't strain yourself, Mac. Well, what is it you want, anyway? I want Danny out of that jail. Well, listen here, I cannot do that, Sergeant. They want a little bail. It's a serious charge. I'm and... not I'm not talking about bail. Release him to our custody. We'll be responsible. If he's wanted, he'll be here. Then we'll help you on this case. Well, maybe we might fix it up for you. Better get busy and send Danny down here. I want to talk to him. I'll do my best, Sergeant. But man to man now. Could you know just give me a line on what you got on this case? Not while Dan is in jail, Mac. But I'll do this much. See this man wanted notice? Sure. We we'll have it ourselves. There are so many of them that I haven't had the time to be studying them all. Well, just take a good look at this one. It's important. Hmm. John McNaughton, alias William Grover, wanted for burglary and assault in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yes, he crossed the border illegally two days ago. He's up here, Mac. And while we're talking of him, he's the man we have all the patrols after. It's an immigration case, so you can forget about that complaint. Did you pick him up? No, we let him through. Wanted to see what he was after. Take a look at his picture, Mac. Forget the mustache. Ever see him before? Well, no. Can't say that exactly. Know him yourself? 
No, but he's very like somebody I'm interested in. But what's that got to do with a Canada Western case? Never mind that now. Go and get Danny. Well, I'll let him out on a public order for questioning. And in the meantime, perhaps I can feel a release of custody. All right, hurry up. Look here, Sergeant. I wish you'd tell me something. What is it, Martin? Is this just a bluff, or has this man McNaughton really got anything to do with the Canada Western case? I think he's the man who got that hundred thousand dollars, Marshal. But what have you got on him? Nothing yet. Only that he uh, looks like the sort of man who would do it. What? L- looks like? Oh, but look here, Sergeant. You can't pull a man for that. No, he'd want something more. But the whole basis of this crime is personal appearance. Just think a minute. Fishborough's alibi depends on that. And the story of Mason and Danny rests on the fact that the robber looked like the manager. Yes, there's something in that. Well, never mind that now. Let's go and have lunch. Danny will be here when we get back, and it's going to be a very amusing afternoon. I tell you, I have to see him. Sure didn't he send for me? Here's Danny, Sergeant. Oh, hello, Danny. Come in. How are you feeling? Well, no, Sergeant. It, it was mighty fine of you to get me out of that jail. That's all right, Danny. Oh, but listen now. It's it, it's not over yet. And, and don't you be troubling about me. Uh, I can I can face the music, Peter. Uh, I know, Danny. But you won't have to do that. They got you out. You're going to stay out. Now, um, just answer me one question. When you searched the manager's office last night, what did you find? Ooh, there weren't a thing out of place. But in that little room behind the office. Get this down, Marshal. Well, yes, it, it's it's a little room with a, with a sofa in it and, and, a, and a wash basin. What did you find there? Well, there was a grey suit thrown on the sofa. It's Mr. Fishbury's. Sure, I hung it up on the stand. That's all. Did you phone McCross, Marshal? Yes. I told him to ask Mr. Fishbury to go over to the city police station for an interview. He'd be there by now. All right. And what about that other thing? I picked that up, too. Sent for Scythe and Palmer down with a warrant to arrest John McNaughton in room 47, Craven Hotel. If he was there, they should have him down to the city police headquarters by now. Good. We ought to be hearing from our friend Mac pretty soon. What can they do without any evidence, Sergeant? And we'd better be going down. McCross is expecting you. No, I'm going to stay here, Marshal. I'm interested to hear what happens when that bank manager sees McNaughton. But what about all this evidence? Hadn't we better get it into shape? Somehow I don't think we'll need it, Marsh. Not at present, anyway. If those two men come together, I believe we'll get the whole story without any questioning. Sergeant. Hello? Hello, Mac. What's wrong? Well, I never saw such a thing in my life. What? We got the bank manager down to the station, and we were strolling around waiting for you. And when the door flew open, and then boys you was brought in, McNaughton. Good. What happened? Ah, oh, come away now. You can find what happened. This fellow McNaughton's the dead spitting image of Fushborough, where there's a like as two peas. But what happened? <laughs> they flew at their throats, and when I got him apart in five minutes, we had the whole story. Listen, who is this McNaughton fella? He might be the twin brother of the other man. Not only might be, but he is. Did you get that money? Sure, we got the most of it. The boys find it down in McNaughton's room. Well, that's that. Come on, Danny, my lad. We'll go down and make out the release for you. I will not. Listen now, Wendy McCross. I'm going out for a drink with Sergeant Blair. Go away and get your dirty papers. Bring them into the office and wait till I get back. Well, whatever you say. Hold on now, Sergeant. There's just one or two things I can't get in this case. Is this McNaughton really twin brother to Fishborough? Yes, he's his brother. He tried to blackmail the manager. Fishborough was in trouble, so he planned that robbery. Well, what about that new $10 bill he gave Danny? Or rather, I suppose it was the brother who gave it to him. How did he get it before the safe was robbed? He got it out of the bundle that came in that day. But the teller checked the numbers. Checked them, yes. He looked at the starting and finishing numbers. I see. What's the importance of the grey suit? Oh, that wasn't important. Just the link that put me onto the plot. Fishborough took that grey suit for his brother to put on. The brother didn't use it. But when he got to the bank, he threw it out of the grip to make room for the money. Yes, it all fits in. Yes. Come on, Danny. I'll be with you, Sergeant. You have heard episode 20 in Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the next episode in this series entitled The Goose Lake Robbery.
Blair of the Mounties, the story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We present the 21st episode in Blair of the Mounties. Our story again goes back to the early days of the Yukon mining camps, as related to Inspector Blair's old friend, Angus McGregor, over the chessboard. I your move, Angus. <laughs> what is the use, Inspector? I mind the day when you didn't a a queen for your castle. <laughs> but no, I haven't won a game for years. <laughs> this heat of mine is getting all foggy, I'm thinking. What about the story, laddie? I'm afraid I'm just about run out of stories, Angus. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the Goose Lake robbery? No, I didn't remember it, only we. You remember the gold strike up on the fishing river in the spring of 99? Aye, I remember it wheel. It didn't last long. No, but they took out quite a bit of gold that year. Goose Lake was the staging camp. The express shipments used to lay overnight in the safe, reach the landing next day. The robbery happened while I was sergeant at the landing. Ten thousand dollars worth of dust cleaned out one night. Did the blow the safe? No, it was opened by an expert. Wasn't much of a safe as uh, they come nowadays. Well, let's hear the story, laddie. All right, here we go, Angus. Hello, Mike. Anybody special on the boat? Oh, he got a... That's the funniest looking fellow you've seen in a blue moon. Huh? Comes from your own country, too, I'm thinking. What's funny about him? Well, no. No offense, no, Sergeant. There's funny people in every country, even in old Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> but this fell is the limit. He's going up to Goose Lake for the hunting, and he ought to see the claws on him. Sportsman, eh? <laughs> I suppose so. He has a pile of baggage along and enough guns to start a war. Did you check up his permits? Oh, sure, he's coming over. Wants to talk to you. Wish now, here he is, be done. Right. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Come in. Come in with you, mister. Let's see now. Uh, what did you say your name was? Oh, Vendela is the name. Oh, oh sure. Shake hands with Mr. Van Dolan, Sergeant. Oh, uh, how do you do, Sergeant? Uh, do you? I uh, was uh, just going up to Goose Lake for a little spot of shooting, don't you know? I see. Got your permits? I'd like to look them over. Hey, Jove. Uh, oh, yes, yes. There you are, Sergeant. Thanks. So you're going shooting, Mr. Van Dusen, are you? Have you had any experience, experience? now? Experience? Oh, my dear fellow. Oh, what a question. Uh, uh, hang it all, experience. Uh, oh, I see. Why do you ask? Well, I'm a pretty good shot myself now. Tell me now, did you ever do any ramrod shooting? Ramrod shooting? My dear fellow. I never even heard of it. There you are now. Well, I'll tell you. Back in County Clare, we used to load up the old blunderbuss with a big charge of powder and one of them old-fashioned ramrods. Then I'd go out and lay by the side of the lake, and all I had to do was to get a couple of three ducks in line yeah. and then... Uh, cut it out, Ravity. All right, Mr. Vandler, the permits are all in order. Hope you have some good sport. Oh, thank you so much, Sergeant. Oh, Ravity, take this gentleman over the hotel and see they give him a good room, will you? Okay, Sergeant. This way, Mr. Van Dooligan. No, as I was telling you, this here ramrod should be the one. Oh, ho, 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 ho
<laughs> Must spend a lot of money for cartridges. I'll be dead. He has an outfit and lords him himself. I believe he gets more kick out of that than the shooting. Well, get into your clothes and get the horses. We've got to get up there right away. Oh, sure, I thought as much. Bad says to it. Why didn't I stick to farming when I did this thing? I tell you, I, I saw this man working at the seat. Uh, drawing my revolver, I called upon him to surrender. Oh, <laughs> the boy, the boy. Uh, look out, look out, here's the cops. Come on now, clear out with you, the whole lot of you. Oh, gee, why, why can't we stick it out here? Hello, Rafferty. What's doing? Well, yo, Percy, come in. Come in, will you? Oh, certainly, certainly, my dear old chap. Oh, good morning, Sergeant. So Good we night. meet again, as they say in the jolly old storybooks, what? Uh, you know, it's funny, but I, I was just uh, going to say to you, uh, by Jove... Uh, uh, look here, what do you know about this robbery? Uh, well, oh, yes, yes, quite so, quite so, the robbery. Yeah. <laughs> quite an exciting affair, I assure you, Sergeant. As I was saying, uh, every crime, don't wait you know, has its own baby. How did you come to be here when the thing happened? Hey, my dear fellow, you see, I sleep almost directly above, oh. hearing a noise in the night. I picked up my revolver and we crept to quietly downstairs. What was my surprise to see a man working at the well, What did you do? Well, uh, pointing my gun at him, I called upon him to surrender. <laughs> Instead of obeying my command, he threw a chair at me. When I got to my feet again, the man had disappeared. You shot at this fellow? Yeah, well, uh, oh, to be quite truthful, Sergeant, my revolver went off. In the excitement, uh, apparently the man was hit. Yes, uh, there were blood spots on the floor. Happy <laughs> death. I thought it was an accident. All right, wait a minute. Can you describe this man? Well, really, Sergeant, I, I couldn't say precisely. He seemed to be rather a small sort of chappy, uh, but he was so dark, you see. Uh, all right, Percy. Thanks very much. I'll see you later. Delighted to be of any assistance, my dear fellow. Here he is, boys. We're picking him up in this swamp. Uh, they got that fellow, Sergeant. He shot through the arm. All right. Well... What's your name? Kalensky, Pete Kalensky. Where's the stuff you got out of that safe? Where is it? Say, I'd like to know myself. Come on, where is it? Say, listen, I don't know anything about this. Oh, no? Just shot yourself by accident, I suppose. Come on, Kalensky. We have a witness who saw you at that safe last night. Sure, that's okay. I was here, but I didn't get no dust. What? Sure. Oh, what's the use of stalling? I ain't got it. Gee, three weeks I put in framing this job, and all I get is the slug through the arm. Can you beat it? Hold on. You mean to say you didn't open that safe? Sure I opened it. But I'm telling you, there was nothing in there. Oh, be good. That's a good one. Do you expect anybody to believe that? Well, ah, suit yourself. You got me, ain't you? You know what happened. I just got the safe open when a guy busts in on me with a gun. I throws a chair at him, see? And he gets me through the arm. Uh, can you beat it? What do you think, Sergeant? Oh, it might be true. Anyhow, we'll take you along, Kalinsky. I'm warning you, if we find out that you got that stuff, it's going to be a lot tougher for you. So if you have anything else to say, you'd better talk now. I tell you, I ain't got it. Hello, Rafferty. Any news? Ah, uh, devil a bit. I'm thinking we'll never see that stuff, Sergeant. Looks like it. Did you see the inspector up at Fishing River? Sure. He has four men on. They're combing the whole place and not a sign. Uh, it's his theory that Kalinsky had a partner who headed back to the claims with that dust. It's mighty little chance to get it if that's the case. Well, it's a nice black eye for us, Ravity. The express company and the insurance people are howling their heads off. They've had to put up the money to the owners of that uh, stuff, of course. Well, the inspector told me to remind you that everything coming down to the London has to be searched until further on. Gosh, don't we know that? Any news from Goose Lake? Not a thing. Did you see your friend Percy up there? <laughs> sure I did. Oh, he's a great lad, this Percy. <laughs> Still blazing away at them ducks. Have the time of his life. Be that it sounds like a battle when he's out there shooting. Yes, he's a persevering chap. He is that. Goes out with a sack full of cartridges and blazes away for an hour or two, and then comes back in and lords up another lot, and out he goes again. Doesn't he ever get anything? Well, <laughs> now and then. He, he knocked over a big Canada goose the other day, and the whole population of Goose Lake had a celebration. <laughs> Three drinks for the crowd and pussy making speeches all over the place. <laughs> Did he say anything about the robbery? Did he? Oh, be dead. He's full of theories. Let's see. Get that, Rafferty. Hello? Who is it? Who? Oh, good evening to you, Slim. What's the trouble now? What? Hold on there now. Where did you find what out? What is it, Rafferty? Hold on, Sergeant. Oh, be dead. This is funny. Hello, Slim. Who found it? What? Oh, Percy, you say? Oh, well, no. 
That's a funny one. Oh, and listen, Slim. Uh, if you change your mind about selling that bull terrier, you yeah, let Randy. me know. Yeah. Hold on now, Sergeant. It's nothing now. Well, well, give me that phone, Rafferty. Good goodbye, Slim, me boy. Rafferty, what's that message? I'll be dead. That's a square one. Our old friend Percy's in the limelight again. What was that message? Well, Percy was out fishing this afternoon, and he hooked onto something and broke the tackle. The fellow in the boat with him was curious, so they dragged around a bit with a boat hoop, and he fetched up a bundle of canvas sacks, the ones that had the gold in them, and they were sunk in the lake. Good Lord, that's a funny one. We have to get up there in the morning. Well, Percy's bringing down the evidence. He's going out on tomorrow's boat. Says the ducks is moving south. I see. All right, we'll talk to him in the morning. Uh, top of the morning to you, Percy. Did you bring them sacks? Yes, uh, well, uh, ho, 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 really, really, it's my dear old friend Rafferty. Well, the sergeant, too. Right, Here right. we are. Yes, yes, I brought the evidence along. I, I see, sergeant, we're getting home. Oh, getting on, is it? Sure, no, that's right. All we need now is the gold and the man that stole it. We did. And so you're leaving us, huh? Yes, my dear boy, frightfully sorry and all that sort of rot, don't you know? I'd really like to stay and uh, help you with this jolly old robbery. Where's your baggage, Percy? Baggage, my dear fellow? Yes, you see, we have to search all baggage since that robbery. Yes. Just a matter of form, you know. Oh, certainly, my dear chap. Everything's here. Five gun cases, four suitcases, and uh, three cases of ammunition. <laughs> all right, Mike, take a look over it. I'll have to get a statement for you about finding those sacks, Percy. Oh, certainly, old boy. Most extraordinary thing. Uh, broke my best rod, too. Started fishing around with the boat hook, uh, don't you know, and there were the jolly old sacks. I see. Well, they're not much use without the gold, of course. Everything all right? The baggage, Rafferty? Sure. Nothing but clothes and guns and cartridges. All right, Percy. I'll give you a lift with your boxes down to the boat. Oh, please don't trouble, dear old boy. Uh, there's a man coming down from the hotel. Ah, sure, it's no trouble. Give me a halter, one of them boxes. Oh. Oh, what the devil now? That's a heavy box. Give it a high stand to me shoulder, Sergeant. Hold on. Good Lord. Why didn't I think of that before? Open that box, Rafferty. Eh? Give me one of those cartridges. Look out. Grab that yeah, dog. Hold, hold still there now, Percy, me boy. I'll take that elegant little gun now. Look here. I protest against this interference. Don't touch those cartridges. Give me a knife, Rafferty. There they are, Sergeant. Hold still now, Percy. Ah. Cartridges, eh? Huh. There's three ounces of gold dust in this one if there's a grain. All right. Bring him along, Rafferty. Well, well, Percy, me boy. You certainly brought down the evidence. You have heard episode 21 in the dramatic series, Blair of the Mounties. Tune in for the next episode in this series, entitled The Star Ruby of Talangor.